I'm just going to start by reading a little bit of the press release. This hasn't been sent out yet, but it is going to be sent out to um, all the news outlets that I'm connected to. Sarah will likely send it out to places that she's connected to. So, and if any of you want a copy, <laughs> we can give you a copy to send it as well. So I'm just going to read that as a little introduction. Then we're going to dive right into the interview with Sarah. Author Sarah Barkoff returns to the literary scene with her second novel, Emmy Gold is Totally Extraordinary, a punchy and relevant upper middle grade fiction that reads like Hannah Montana meets Mean Girls. A former child actress, Barkoff was inspired by her experiences traveling with Broadway plays and starring in a 90s horror movie. She poured her own memories into the creation of her main character, Emmy, and the result is a heartwarming and funny journey into the experience of a young girl trying to find her footing beyond the spotlight. I loved it, said rising star Everly Carganilla. Am I saying that name right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. An actress in Netflix, Yes Day, and Spy Kids Armageddon. It's really heartwarming and shows that people can change even if at first it seems like they can't. It kept surprising me and every chapter was more exciting than the last. I just couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. I think everyone should read this book, girls, boys, young people, and grown-ups too. Haley Wenger, author of Managing the Matthews, commented, this is the perfect book for preteens or young teens going through those rough middle school years, dealing with periods, boys, friend drama, and family pressure. With palpable antidotes of the New York City audition scene, a charming look at the irksome and wonderful connection a brother and sister can have, and a touching message about following your own dreams rather than those of someone else, Emmy Gold is Totally Extraordinary is sure to inspire young and old alike to chase after their true passion. So first of all, Sarah, congratulations. Thank you. This is an exciting day. Do you want to talk a little bit about what today has been like for you? It's been really exciting and just like heartwarming with all the support from friends and family and people who just seem really genuinely excited for the book. It's just, it's meant a lot to me. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a really exciting day. Good. Good. Do you want to share a little bit about the journey of writing this book? Like how, how long has this taken? When did you start writing? Well, the journey of the book is kind of a long one, to be honest. I had written a different version of this book in like, maybe it was about 2011. So it was a young adult version. I had heavily sent it out to a lot of agents and publishers and it got you know, it was my, the first book that I had ever written and it got a ton of attention, a ton of traction, but it just never really made it. You know, it was my very first stab at writing a novel. So I don't think that I was necessarily like ready yet. Then I wrote The Wanderers and that book took me a really long time to write. And I worked on that for many years. And then um, I was kind of coming out of writing The Wanderers and, you know, the hype from, from all of that. And then COVID started. And that was really when I started rewriting it. I had the thought to kind of resurrect <laughs> the Emmy Gold story, um, kind of reinvent it, reimagine the whole thing, make it middle grade. It essentially turned out to be a completely different story, um, different characters, everything, but the the premise of the child actress thing was what remained the same. I kind of did it to cheer myself up a little like during COVID. So I had just written something really heavy and like really dark. I think a lot of people were, were really surprised by that. Like I got a lot of feedback. Wow, like that was really, really dark. You know, I wanted to just write something lighter. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to make myself laugh. That's really why I wrote this book. So, you know, I just remember like watching all of the news about like New York and how the whole city was shut down and seeing the pictures of the super busy streets of New York, just desolate. And I was, I just kind of wanted to like go there in my, if only in my mind. So, um, you know, the, there's a specific chapter where she travels into the city and is in a subway or in a 
you know, a cab. And I put that in there really for myself because I wanted to talk about all of the things that I love about New York, all my favorite things. And I kind of wanted to, you know, just cheer myself up, make myself happy. And I had such a good time writing this book. And it's funny because like when I read through it, I think it is really heavily conveyed. It's just, it's really feel good. And that's the whole motivation from beginning to end. It's to make people feel good, to make you laugh. It's light. So that was the journey with, with writing it. You lived a portion of your life in New York city. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the parts about New York, it really reflects that that's coming from real experience and it com- really comes across that you love the city. I, yeah. Yeah. Has it been a while since you visited or do you go back often? We we go back for like a longer visit for, you know, about a week out of the year. We're usually in Long Island, but I make a point to every single time to like just go into the city myself and have those moments and just see if it's still you know, exactly as I remembered it. Yeah. I think every single book I've ever written so far is, you know, the, the, the backdrop is always seems to be New York or like New Jersey. And I think it is because I spent so much time there and it is a very inspiring place. Like just New York itself. Like there's so much, there's so much to write about. Does it have the same magic for you today as it did years ago? It does. I mean, it for me, it never loses its magic. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it it and I think for a lot of people, you know, it's it's that it's one of those special places for me. And every time I get off the subway and I'm in, in the city, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm 18 again, mm-hmm. you know, when I first when I first got to New York. And it's just fun to kind of like reminisce, you know, because at 40 years old now, it's like, it it feels like a lifetime ago, but also so fresh in my mind. When I'm reading the book and I, I read all the little references to the city, it, I'm glad like I will have that to look back on because keep those memories alive. Yeah. Were any of Emmy's experiences, uh, like we see her in an audition in New York is that reflective of your own experience? Yeah. So another thing that I wanted to, you know, touch on when I was writing those few chapters where she's, you know, in the audition and in the moment where like, I watch a lot of TV where they convey like auditions or that scene. And it just, it never really feels authentic to me to like what it's really like. It feels like the, it often feels like, you know, sort of what it is, but it's not quite there, especially when dealing with like child actors, a lot of people like heavily lean on, you know, that a child actor has to be almost messed up you know, or damaged in some way. And I wanted to show my own experience, you know, where, where, you know, yeah, there might be a little, there, there might be some experiences that like your typical kid doesn't have. And that, you know, as a 40 year old, I can reflect on it. Like, wow, that was kind of heavy for like a nine-year-old to deal with. But yeah, I mean, when she's in the audition room and, you know, all of that pressure and, you know, like I focused a lot on that and like what she's feeling and who's looking at her and like what the room smells like and, you know, all of those things, I wanted it to be really authentic. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, it is a pretty close reflection of things that I experienced in my own life, but maybe not quite my memory as a child, but maybe like auditioning when I was a little bit older. So that's probably what I drew more from. Sure. Were you that young when you were auditioning or you were older? Both. So I, there was a period of time in my, my childhood where um, I was auditioning all the time and working. And then 
you know, as inspired by the book, decided I wanted to just be ordinary. Mm -hmm. And so that was my choice. My parents let me have that choice. Mm -hmm. I went back to like middle school, high school. I lived a normal life for six or seven years. And then I, I think when I, it was time to graduate, I was like, okay, I kind of bored with this ordinary life. I kind of want to go back to New York. And so I did. And then I had that experience in my early adulthood mm-hmm. also. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any memories of terrible additions? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I have many. I have, there's a few that stand out in my mind. Not so much when I was a kid. Cause I think when you're a kid, you can really get by just being like cute most of the time. And I talk about that in the book. There's a lot to be said, but when you get older, the stakes are higher and people really expect more out of you. And I think it took me a little while to realize that like, okay, everyone here is really good. You know, I remember like one of my first Broadway auditions, like when I was probably 18 or 19 and just being like every single person here could be the lead in this play right now. I'm not the exception. Like I'm just another one of these people. How do I get noticed? But yeah, I have a couple bad ones that I often talk about this audition. I think it was when I was um, like early in college studying musical theater. There used to be these things in like a newspaper that would say like dance call and, you know, looking for girls like 18 to 24. And it used to say like dancer, singer, actress, and it would kind of rate in which like you were strongest. And sometimes it would say singer, dancer, actress, or actress, singer, dancer, whatever. And this one was like dancer, singer, actress. So, you know, I could dance, but it wasn't like, you know, maybe my starring quality. And I went to a a dance call and I think it was for Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. And I literally pirouetted like into a mirror and I I actually left I was so embarrassed that I left yeah I was like I have to get out of here so like I just kind of like wait and I just like let myself fade into the background and I went out the door and I remember I could hear them calling my name you know they were like Sarah Barkoff like you know like it's like because I was the next one to go up again I was like I'm just not doing it and I left <laughs> It wasn't as like, I guess it's not as sad as it sounds. It's really not. It was funny. I mean, it's like, it's something I think back about and I laugh a okay, lot. That's, that's good because I think some yeah, I think I like traumatizing. The mirror with my face. <laughs> it was pretty bad. <sighs> okay. In the book, there's quite a theme of bullies. One of the first things that I said to you after I read it was I felt real mean girls vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Cassidy Kane is kind of our main bully. She's, she's on the cover. She's got a bit of attitude and she has quite, quite a thread through the whole story. That's really compelling and really, really important. But what I wondered was, did you have a Cassidy Kane in your (laughs) middle school years? And did you draw on that to kind of flesh out her character? I did. Yeah. So I did have a Cassidy Kane. It was in high school, um, not middle school, but yes, I did draw from that. She really made my life hell. Like, to be honest, you know, I didn't have like, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but you know, there wasn't any big like scene, you know, like in the book where everyone is staring at you, but it was more of a day-to-day type of just chipping away like she's always just kind of there like popping up like couldn't escape her it didn't go on for very long but I did draw from that just kind of that like fake nice that person who's going to stab you in the back Mm -hmm. um yeah so I drew from it but it's definitely fiction okay yeah yeah definitely fiction (laughs) you have no fear of someone from your past picking up the book and going this is me (laughs) no it's it's like it's really not too close and you know that that person I don't think um I I I don't think so I don't have any type of contact with her or mutual friends I don't think she thinks about me ever (laughs) I don't think (laughs) (laughs) okay 
Emmy and her brother Oscar have a very special relationship that we see grow through the book. Do yeah. you have a brother? I have two older brothers. Yeah. So um, I did draw a little bit from my relationship with my brothers. Uh, my brothers are a bit older than I am, than Emmy and Oscar. I put them very tight, more like my son and my daughter. But yes, I have two older brothers. So I did draw from that kind of navigating, you know, maybe her living a separate life from the family and then coming back Dad. into the family unit. Um, <laughs> I hear my, my daughter. So yeah, I did draw from that a bit. The whole dancer aspect, and I don't want to give like too much away. That whole thing is purely fiction. One of the very cute details are the names of the three siblings. <laughs> so we have Oscar, Emmy, and Tony, yes. which are the three big awards <laughs> for um, yes. for acting did you ever <laughs> toy with the idea of throwing a grammy in there like what kind of kid would be named I did. I did I actually did um that was in the first book it, she actually had a grandma that they that she called grammy and it was her mom's mom um yeah so I did toy around with that and I actually got that idea and I bet my dad doesn't even remember this but when I was little, I remember my dad, somebody saying like, to me, even as a kid, like, do you want kids or do you want, and my dad saying like, she's not, no, she's going to have like an Emmy, Oscar and a Tony. <laughs> and I just remember thinking that was really funny and remembering it. And so when I started writing the book and I was trying to come up with like, you know, ways to show the reader that the mom was just not as not a bad stage mom, but just like a little eccentric, like a little bit like, you know, too involved in the career. I was like, I have to put that in there because it's I thought it was funny. <laughs> I think it's a great little detail and and I think it's so cute. I I loved it. If Emmy ever went on to win a Grammy, what <laughs> genre of music would she be performing in? Uh, definitely pop. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Like bubblegum pop for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Like resurrect like a Britney Spears type, like type of pop that you don't see anymore. Like we need that. Yeah. yeah. That's what you would. Do. Yeah. Bring it back. Bring, bring Britney back. <laughs> <laughs> if you could cast someone as Emmy, did you have anyone in, in mind when you, when you picture this being made into a movie? Wow. Um, yes, actually. So um, around, but this was more around the time that I first started writing it. My daughter was really into, what was that show? It's a Disney show. Um, not Vampirina, but the other one uh, where she's like the French, I can't think, maybe somebody can, you know, comment. I can't think of it. It's a Disney show on Disney Junior. And the little girl who is the voice of the main character on the show, I just thought she was so cute. And I, you know, would, I thought she had such an amazing singing voice. And um, I looked her up and her name was Mia, which is my daughter's name. And I was like, oh, I could totally see like her, but like she's aged out. Like she's definitely sure. like 16 something now, but Honestly, like Everly Carganilla, the the one who read the book. Yeah, I could I could see her. I think she's adorable and I could see her pull it off for sure. Do you have more Emmy books planned? Yeah, so I'm about I think about 80 pages into the second installment. The the writing process has been halted a little bit with with summer break. <laughs> but um, you know charging along. I'm not a super fast writer. So, you know, I'm about to get to the middle of the book and I think I know where it's going. I, I write, you know, what do they call it? Right from the hip. I don't plan, 
really? Like I have a general idea of like what's going to happen. I know how, I always know how it's going to end. I always know what the middle is and I always know what the beginning is, but I don't know what's going to happen in between. I let it surprise me because I think that's part of the fun of it. And I think it comes out a lot more organically. I'm hoping to finish it by maybe like November. What kind of a schedule are you on? Like how regimented are you with your writing time? How, how much do you guard that? You just steal a moment where you can. I don't guard it at all. I I can't with like my kids. Like I can't, I can't guard it. I can't be like, I'm going to go into my writing cave and like, write. No, I just, I get like, usually it goes in spurts and I get inspired by something, you know, like music or I can sometimes just wake up like with ideas, like something that comes to me and, you know, I'll, you know, spit out 20 pages or, you know, when it's not like that, I try to write two pages a day and that doesn't sound like a lot, but two pages a day, five days a week is like, you have, you know, 60,000 words usually after about seven, eight months, you know, that's, I'm kind of like, calculating editing into it too but yeah so I just do a little bit at a time slow and steady wins the race yeah and what is it about writing that keeps you coming back a lot of different things um there have been many times throughout writing where I've just been really um done with the process of publishing and it's a really draining process and often with not a lot of reward recognition you know lots of people's attitude is like oh like my sister wrote a book or like you know it's just like you hear just like not I'm not you know if anyone's sister wrote a book I'm not (laughs) saying bad about that I'm just not you know not a lot of people really understand like the trials and tribulations of it and how it is such a um like you really have to love doing it because if you didn't, you would have been weeded out, you know? And there have been times where I've tried to stop and I'm like, oh God, this is just so, this is, this just sucks. Like I, you know, I, I, I'm not getting to where I want to get and you want to just stop. But I think for me, what keeps me coming back is I have like a creative you know, bone, I I have lots of creative bones in my body and like, you know, with kids and everything, I need an outlet to create. And I think probably what keeps me coming back is it's an easy, it's not an easy, but it's, it's a very good outlet for me with my situation with um, being a mom, you know, it's a way that I don't have to like go out, you know, of my house. Like I still, like I found ways to keep myself happy and inspired, even staying home with my kids. Are you part of a writer's group or do you have a writing partner that helps keep you accountable? Are are you in this alone? What what kind of a support (laughs) system do you have around you? I have three three really, really good writing friends who um, I lean heavily on. You know, I met them through that mentorship, Write Mentor, and we've kept in touch. I don't know if any of us need to keep each other accountable. We, We don't really do that for each other, but we all know the way the business works and they always have lots of good insight and, you know, we'll help each other with like, you know, creating tweets and stuff when there's those contests and stuff and agents and publishers and who to contact and what to do and, you know, what bouncing off story ideas. So I have a few people, but my circle is, is small. I'd love to be a a bigger part of the community, but I just, so far it's, you know, it's a tight, it's a tight group. And things take time. Like you can only spread yourself so thin. Yeah. 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 And we read each other's stuff. So I don't think I could have many more. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. A couple of really good, good peers that you trust. I'm happy to know that you're not, you're not in this alone. I'm not at all. I have some great, um, great contacts and I, you know, I've known them for now, like probably five or six years. So it's been a while. Uh, You build real, real relationships. Yeah, for sure your artwork. You had a real vision 
for <laughs> what you wanted your cover to look like and then what you wanted the inside of the book to look like? Yeah, so um, it was really important to me with this book to, and thank you, by the way, for letting me have so much control, but um, for being more in control of my book cover and the back cover also. When I was a kid, I loved when there were little illustrations incorporated throughout the book. I would love to like look for that, especially in chapter books. Not only was the cover super important to me, but like curating the perfect little illustration for each chapter to give a hint. You know, everything for me was really, really, really thought out. You know, it was all things that I dreamed up and gave hours and hours of thought to because what is the person going to be thinking when they open the chapter? Like I wanted the little picture to give you a clue about what it was going to be about. And also the chapter titles, like I wanted to do that and I wanted to play around with that and make it kind of funny and, you know, fun. Like what's the next chapter title going to be? I did have a vision with the cover, but I just like, I didn't really know what I wanted. I just knew I wanted something amazing. <laughs> so um, I found, I just like, I, I, I was like, I know I'm going to know what I want when I see it. And I think I told the illustrator, Heidi Cannon, that too. And she was like, okay. Like, I remember just kind of having these conversations with her. She was like, I think I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. So she was really fantastic because she created a bunch of different covers. And then I was able to mix and match what I liked about each one and then create essentially the perfect cover. So yeah, I love how it turned out. And then, you know, the tag on the bottom with being ordinary has never been more extra that literally came to me in a dream. I was like, I woke up, I was like, we need a tag. I need a catchy tag. <laughs> and I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I think that's perfect. So yeah, everything was just, was very intricately thought out on my part. But yeah, yeah it came together. It looks effortless. It's just this beautiful, beautiful book. It, it's so nice to read it and to see those illustrations and to see how they inform the story. Like it's a real kind of reciprocal experience. Yeah. If that makes any sense. I think kids who read it will really have fun with it. And that's, you know, that's my hope. I used to um, read a lot of like Roald Dahl when I was a kid and he's he's probably one of my biggest like inspirations like with just what I used to read as as a kid and he always had those little illustrations and it wasn't a lot but it was just a little and I can still see them in my head you know that's the thing like the twits that book I can still see like you know, how everything was labeled and I was really trying to emulate something like that okay well it came together really beautifully Heidi did a beautiful job yeah she did she did. She's super talented. And we'll, we'll open it up for questions after, after you do the reading, um, if anyone okay. wants to ask them. So uh, okay. the floor is yours. Okay. All right. Emmy Gold is totally extraordinary. Chapter one. Kind of a big deal. Psst. Basically, if you want to know the truth, my entire life has been nothing more than one big fat lie. When you're an actress, well, ex-actress in my case, nothing you see is actual reality. This blemish-free skin, that's just good lighting, super strategic makeup applied by a professional. This confident pearly white smile, yep, those are porcelain veneers mom insisted on because she didn't want me to have a mouthful of braces and lose out on rolls. My resume isn't any different. Here's a peek. Name, Emmy Gold, age 13. Eyes, sapphire blue. Hair, warm chestnut brown. Height, four foot 10. Weight, 100 pounds. Special talents include singing, Pop, musical theater, country, opera, rap, legit doodler, dancing, tap, jazz, ballet, hip hop, basically a ballroom prodigy. Instruments, flute, violin, harp, piano, guitar, clarinet, serious drum skills. Other noteworthy talents include 
slaying at the jump rope, champion of the hula hoop, somersaults, back handsprings, toe touches, can do a killer British accent, splits, no-handed backflips, and many, many more. Just ask. Spoiler alert, if you haven't yet guessed, it was all hoopla. And I mean every last bit of it. Mom's the one who penned this bamboozle list of deceit. She's got a knack for stretching the truth and making everyone believe anything she says. Seriously, once when I was four, she told my agent I could read when I couldn't. There I stood, wobbly legs with a heavy script in my hands, as a room full of casting directors waited for me to start reading my lines. I didn't know what else to do, so I started talking about unicorns and rainbows. They were dazzled, thought I was adorable, and needless to say, I got the part. Mom was thrilled and greeted me with a wink as I emerged from the casting room. It was probably her plan all along. If anyone's wondering, my real resume should have read something like this. Name, Emmy Gold, age 13, eyes, boring slate gray, hair, mousy brown, height, four foot 10, depends on the shoes to be honest. Wait, no comment, weighing yourself is so archaic, am I right? Special talents include absolutely and positively nothing. Seriously, I wasn't even good at remembering my lines when I started on Helping Hannah. And it's the reason I was fired, by the way. The producers got fed up with me flubbing lines during live tapings, but what no one knows is that I did it on purpose. Maybe that sounds a little psycho, but let's say I had a very good reason. As soon as I started outgrowing the cute pigtail kid I was when filming began, and into someone who needs a bra, I know, so embarrassing, right? The show's writers didn't know what to do with me anymore. Slowly, they cut my lines down so much that I was barely a part of the show. It felt weird being somewhere I didn't belong, and I had no choice but to take measures into my own hands. So when the director yelled, action, clapped the little snappy board, I chew on the inside of my cheek and pretend not to know what to say. After a few months, I got the ax. It's all good though. I'm absolutely thrilled to get away from the spotlight because now I can finally breathe. Ah, and you know what? I don't miss it at all. Not one bit. Mm, actually, that's a lie. I totally miss the green room and the endless supply of buttery croissants, licorice, and decaf lattes. The only person who's not happy about me getting fired is mom. Also, she doesn't know anything about Operation Get Yourself Fired, so let's keep that under wraps, okay? We have to because mom's a little crazy. Not totally off a rocker, but she's definitely got a couple screws loose, you know? She's what most people refer to as a stage mother. Actually, she prefers momager because it has more of a modern flair to it, but you get the point. She always wanted to be famous herself. To be honest, it's kind of surprising she never was. She's gorgeous and tall and has a gleaming white smile and does a super dramatic laugh where she flips her head back while she cackles. I guess she never, she probably never made it as an actress because she got married and had us kids soon after. That didn't mean her movie star ambitions were ever far from her mind though. For example, she named me and my brothers Emmy, Oscar, and Tony after the annual entertainment awards shows in television, film, and Broadway. See? I told you she was a little kooky, believe me now. I'm Emmy, by the way. My older brother, Oscar, has zero interest in anything involving glitz and glamor or the flashing of cameras. And my baby brother, Tony, is, well, a baby, so all he pretty much does is mush food around, babble baby nonsense. That leaves me for mom to live out her dreams through. It's September now, a few months since I've been back in the New Jersey burbs and a couple of weeks since I've been back at school. I grab my book bag and hop out of mom's car. The leaves crunch beneath my teal suede high tops as I walk up to the doors of Patterson Middle School. Maybe you're wondering about what it's like to come back to school as a famous kid. Let's just say my reputation precedes me. More than a few times I've been asked to take a selfie with some of the school staff. Awkward. But to be honest, all the kids here seem a little afraid to talk to me like these two girls who are huddled nearby and chatting as I make my way down the hall today. They're in mid-conversation, but when the one with the waist-length brown hair spots me, she elbows her friend and narrows her eyes in my direction. I stare straight ahead and pretend not to notice. I wish I could say this isn't something that happens a lot, but that would be a lie. It's weird. 
I wish they understood that I'm just Emmy, a regular kid like them and not the actress who used to be on a television show every Friday night. The only one who truly gets me is Jasmine. Every morning she greets me at my locker with an air kiss to the cheek. Toodles, she says when she sees me, you look cute. Jasmine is my best friend forever, or more correctly, my friend of about 60-ish days. I met her at the open house before school started and we clicked right away. She cracked a sarcastic joke about me looking exactly like the girl from Helping Hannah and I complimented her outfit. We spent the rest of the time chatting and have been inseparable ever since. Our friendship totally makes sense too. Jasmine has ties to the entertainment industry, so she gets me on a different level than most people. I was a backup dancer for Beyonce and her grandma used to perform with Diana Ross back in the day. You should lose that giant cardigan, cardigan she advises, checking me out head to toe. It's like 70 degrees out and you look like you're about to go out into a blizzard. At least tie it around your waist or something. Jasmine helps me take it off and arranges it around my belly, fussing with it until it looks cool. There, she says, pleased with her work. She's always giving me fashion advice, even if I don't ask for it. She wants to be a fashion designer one day. I was sort of going for a grungy chic look, I tell her, untying the fancy knot and slipping it back on the regular way. It's my thing. She smacks her sparkly lip gloss mouth and rolls her big brown eyes. You do you, she says, but I think you're just trying to cover up the fact that you have the biggest boobs in the eighth grade. I do not, I protest, linking my shoulders in and arranging my long brown hair around my chest. Jasmine has no idea this is a sensitive subject for me, and I know she doesn't mean anything by it, but my ever-changing body is something I've been struggling with for a while. Sometimes it seems like from one day to the next, I wake up and everything is somehow different, bigger, and not in a good way. Back when I was working, I begged the costume designer on set to let me wear tunics, a wrap, a scarf around my neck because it was the only thing I felt comfortable in. Don't worry, no one else can tell. Your concealment efforts are top notch, Jasmine says, winking and clicking her tongue. I wish I had some tatas. She looks down at her chest. Do you think they're growing? I thought maybe they were starting to grow the other day, but now they just kind of look the same. What do you think? Totally growing, I lie, slamming my locker shut. We make our way down the crowded hall to class. I glance down at my chest. Do you really think I have the biggest, I start to ask. Hey, Emmy, are you going to Cassidy's party this Friday? A gruff voice asks. Taylor Jennings struts over to us. His hair swishes across his forehead and he flicks it out of his eyes. The tiny freckles across his nose and cheekbones are enough to make my heart beat faster. Taylor Jennings. Doesn't his name alone scream that he's a total cutie? Gosh, did I mention he's the most swoon-worthy dimples ever? Not sure, I stammer. Haven't been invited yet, but that would be sweet. I'll put in a good word, he says, jutting his chin out, half smiling. See ya, he says, backwards jogging away from us before he turns the corner. Jasmine's mouth drops open. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Do you even realize what just happened? She asks, squeezing my shoulders. Taylor Jennings just spoke to you. And not only that, he just asked if you're going to a party that he's going to. I know, I think I just died, I squeal. Like, I'm pretty sure that I just died. Am I alive? Am I breathing? He's the cutest boy in the entire school and he just talked to me. Everything's coming together, Jazz. Okay, okay, I don't wanna get too excited. What if I don't get invited to Cassidy's party? That would totally suck. Don't start spiraling, she advises, shaking me a little and looking straight into my eyes. You must slow your roll, I nod. But I want to go so badly. Me too. Cassidy has the most epic parties ever. Her parents are super rich and they go all out. I heard this year she's having it at a trampoline park and supposedly they light the whole place up in neon lights while you jump around. My heart thumps beneath my heavy sweater and I place a hand over my chest. So cool. I know, right? She says, but I've never been invited to one of her parties. Cassidy is super selective about who she invites. She has secret meetings with her best friend, Sloane Anderson, and they go through the whole yearbook and cross out anyone who isn't cool enough. That's the rumor anyway. Getting invited to one of her parties is like the biggest deal ever, she tells me. We have to find a way to score some invitations, I say. 
well, you're, you'll for sure get invited, she says. I mean, you're you, you're famous, duh. Me, on the other hand, that's up for debate. I'm not sure Cassidy even knows my name. That's not the problem. Everyone knows who Jasmine is. They just don't get her or her style choices. She's an artist, a free spirit, floating through the halls in her floor-length flowered print dress with graffiti-painted combat boots and a cropped jean jacket, all of which she found and repurposed from the Salvation Army. Personally, I think she's the future of fashion, but others tend to stare and sometimes giggle at her in the hallways. Wouldn't it be so amazing if we both get invited? This is more exciting than the time I was invited to the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards, but I couldn't go because I got mono, I say. No. You're kidding, that stinks, she says. I'm totally serious, but it's fine. I probably would have just gotten slimed and caught pneumonia or something like that. The first bell rings, snapping us back into reality. Shoot, I've got to get to gym, she says, but we'll discuss later, okay? I need to go, swimming today. We both grimace and make gagging noises. Blech. I know, right? My hair is going to totally get ruined. Blah, love you, she shouts as she jets down the hall. See you at lunch, I call after her. Still giddy, I try not to skip as I flit and float my way over to, to language arts with Mrs. Ferris. I reach the door and realize I forgot my book in my locker. Oh, no, not again, I grumble. Mrs. Ferris stands in the doorway, her heavy black bangs flopped over her forehead, skimming her red rimmed reading glasses. Joining us today, Miss Gold, she asks. Yeah, for sure, I answer, but I forgot my book. Can I please go grab it really quick? Hurry up, Miss Gold, she warns, and pivots on one foot, shutting the classroom door with a thud. I power walk down the hall to my locker. When I arrive, I turn the combination to the right, to the left, to the right again, but it doesn't click open. These are the types of things that are still taking some getting used to since being back in the real world. Most kids my age have been using these contraptions for years, but this is all new to me. I breathe and start over, my lips mouthing the numbers as I try again, clicks open. Hooray, I say, opening my locker and grabbing my book. Something falls from the top shelf and onto the floor in front of me, touching my high tops. I bend down to pick it up. It's a piece of paper and I unfold it. My heart stops, hoping it's a birthday invitation, praying it's a birthday invitation to Cassidy's party. It isn't, not even close. Instead, it's an article on me that's been ripped from a women's magazine and on it, someone has scribbled a message across my face with black Sharpie. My pits perspires, the hair on the back of my neck stands up. I know Mrs. Ferris is gonna give me a hard time if I don't hurry, but I can't help it, too stunned to move. I crumple the piece of paper and stuff it back into my book bag. And for a moment, not seeing it makes me feel better, but not for long. A worry keeps creeping back in, a realization, and I can't shake it. Maybe they all know my secret, I think. Maybe this ordinary life isn't as simple as I thought it was gonna be. Hearing you read it just reminds me how well you captured the voice of a <laughs> year old. Like it feels so genuine. Thanks. <laughs> was it fun to put yourself in that age group again? Yeah, it was. I feel like, you know, I'm still like young at heart. So, you know, it's not that far from, you know, how I talk, but, um, you know, there's a lot of me in there, but yeah, it, I had to kind of, you know, rethink like, you know, how would a 13 year old yeah. view this? Yeah. yeah. We're going to open it up for anyone. If anyone has a question they want to ask, um, you can just unmute yourself and pop on camera if you're comfortable. If you're not, that's okay. Um, we'll just leave a minute if anyone has a question. I had a question, actually. Sarah, I love this so much. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, what The very first thing you said when you opened the book was something like, you know, this is all a lie. Yeah. And okay that stuck with me the entire time you were reading because all I could think about is like our reality of using filters on everything like social media filters yeah. like this notion of uh perfectionism and it is all a lie isn't it yeah, <laughs> it <is. laughs> so I wanted to ask you like while you were writing that part and maybe even the book 
were you drawing parallels from our kind of fake fakeness oh yeah and did that help you write it okay oh yeah for sure um you know part of it was you know it, everything you see on social media is so fake and I even have a hard time you know, remembering that, you know, when I look at all these like filtered people and filtered faces, I wanted to kind of show how even in that age group, these like children, they're getting like scooped up into it too. I mean, you see 13 year olds now, it's nothing like when we were 13, you know, in my, in my age group, these girls, like nobody goes through the awkward phase anymore. You know, I wanted to show a character who is real and who's not super filtered and who doesn't want to be super filtered, who just wants to, you know, at the core of this book is just to be who you are, to just be you no matter what. I love that. And I think for my own daughter, you know, she's, she's at about that age. Yeah. Um, and we talk so much about fakeness and about what real contentment is. Yeah. I think it's going to be a really great message for her to read it through your book. So awesome. that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So you have your young daughter. Was that always in the back of your mind, this whole book? Like I would imagine thinking, um, I don't know, like what her experience is going to be, what you might want her to read or not want to read one day? Like, what was that like? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, a really big thing, you know, and I do talk about at the very end of the book and the acknowledgments is a lot of this book was stuff that I want my kids to know. And, you know, stuff that I it took me 40 years to learn, you know, and to relearn it, which is like, really, you just can't go wrong being yourself, you know, and I, I've gotten, you know, gone down slippery slopes, like being a version of myself, you know, and maybe also like having the background that I have, like almost being like a friend of mine said recently, like a chameleon, you know, so like, no matter what room of people I'm in I can always sort of like I always thought that that was like a great life skill and you know now I'm like God, it's kind of like I don't know like the whole book is really about her refiguring out who she is I kind of wanted to make it like a cheat sheet for my both of my kids of you know that reminder it's constant through the book about you know being yourself and like if people don't like you, that's okay. You know, you weed those people out. So yeah, it was always at the forefront of my mind. It's a major, is a major thing. Sarah, if you want to talk about your giveaway. Yeah. So anyone who's here is automatically entered into the giveaway. And so I just, I am going to do a draw like a a virtual spinner on my phone and then I will contact the winners but I just wanted to show some of the um some of the swag items so there's this mug and then on the back it says all that glitters is gold <laughs> and then um we have like a t-shirt and um just like a little tote bag <laughs> And then ever, anyone who wins will also get uh, a copy of the book. And you're going to do that in the next few days? I'm going out of town. So my goal is to send it all out by Friday. <laughs> so um, as you all should know, the book is now available. You can purchase a copy from chickenheadspress.ca. Go to Amazon. The paperback will be available through Barnes & Noble. I don't know if it's actually if it's actually kind of populated there yet. So keep checking if that's where you want to purchase it from. Amazon is going to be your fastest and most cost-effective way to get it because I am in Canada. So if you're ordering from me as the publisher, you're going to, and you're in the States, you're going to have to pay extra shipping, which sucks. Don't feel bad about buying from Amazon. I know some people have um, questionable <laughs> feelings about it, but Sarah does get, still get her portion when it's sold from Amazon. So <laughs> Um, you're not cheating anybody by doing that. 
the greatest thing that you can do for any author is to share their work, share, share links to the book. When you have read it, if you enjoy it, post reviews, yeah. post about the book, yeah. any way you can encourage getting this, the story out, the message out, I think is it, that's, that's really special. That's such a great gift and it costs you nothing beyond the cost of the book initially. And it's just such a great, great way to support. So I want to encourage you all to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you everyone for giving your evening and um, please buy the book, support Sarah and um, the message of this book. It's really worth it. I hope to have a great rest of your evening. And if you have questions about the book, you can always reach out to me through chickenhousepress.ca. I'm sure Sarah's open to have you reach oh, yeah. out. I love, talk I love talking about my book. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations, Mom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <Aww>. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Congrats, Sarah. So happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.